Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is Andrew Faltum. He is a U.S. Navy veteran and a veteran of the Vietnam War. Andrew, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for having me here. Let's start with uh, where you were born and raised. I was originally from Chicago, and uh, before I joined the Navy, I was a Chicago police officer. You were a police officer in the early 70s, so you joined after all the chaos of 1968, but how much unrest was there still? Well, going? at the in 1968, I was a police cadet, which was a part-time position, like a civilian employee uh, during the Chicago Convention. And I remember pacing up and down in front of my TV set at home while uh, all that chaos was going on. Uh, I joined the police department in 1970, uh, missed out on a couple riots, but uh, I became a burglary detective. And uh, at one point, um, a couple of uh, uniformed officers arrested a burglar, and uh, he had to appear in court. Uh, but all he needed is a motion state as a for a continuance until the uh, the perpetrator could get his lawyer and the uh, witnesses to come in and testify. So. I was waiting for the case to be called. It takes about 10 seconds to ask for a date for a continuance. And uh, the court was in 26th in California on the south side of Chicago, one of those old fashioned buildings where they had the high ceilings with the fans making lazy circles. It was packed with humanity. It was July. And I started staring out the window and thinking about being far, far away. So when my case finally got called, oh, by the way, I'd worked uh, midnights the night before, I went down to the recruiting office in Chicago, downtown Chicago and said, take me. So while I was filling out my paperwork, since I was a detective, I was wearing a suit. And the Lieutenant JG, who was the recruiter, came over and said, sir, you could take off your jacket and, you know, while you're filling out the paperwork. So I took off my jacket and then after a few minutes, he came over and said, uh, Sir, could you put your coat back on? Uh, the secretaries are getting nervous. Got a 357 strapped to my side. So uh, I was going to be a naval flight officer. But uh, when I went down to Pensacola, they got around to doing uh, brain scans. And since I had an abnormal brain, they wouldn't let me fly, but they made me an intelligence officer. So while I was in, before I got commissioned, uh, they announced the peace accords on January 27th, uh, 1973. I was con commissioned in February and then went on to uh, intelligence training at Lowry Air Force Base. And that's where I met my future wife. Um, so the old story, if the Navy wanted you to have a wife, they would have issued you one. <laughs> well, they did. So um, I joined the... Um, a tax squadron 115. It was an A6 intruder squadron. Um, they were uh, based on the Midway with uh, Air Wing 5, and the ship had just been um, sent over to Japan. So I missed the Transpac, but I joined the ship uh, after some training in Woodby Island uh, on the air intelligence trade. Um, joined the ship for there for first uh, at sea. And I was on the Midway f uh, from 73 to 76. Let's back up just a, a tad. Why did you choose the Navy? Was it to become a flight officer? Yes. Uh, between the Air Force and the Navy, the uh, Air Force, if you're not a pilot, um, you're not, you don't have the same status. Uh, but in the Navy, the non-pilot aviation specialties were uh, consolidated into Naval flight officers. And they had uh, the opportunities to command squadrons and, and higher command. So um, in terms of a culture uh, for the military, the Navy offered um, more opportunities because I had 20-25 vision in my left eye. So I couldn't make it as a pilot. Um, but I was going to be a naval flight officer until they found out I had an abnormal brainwave. So that's how I got into intelligence. So uh, on board the Midway, you're off the coast of Japan at this point. The peace accords are in effect, but obviously chaos and things are devolving in, in Vietnam at this point. Well, right? it, this was 1973, so um, they had uh, signed the uh, 
peace accords and we had gotten our, our POWs back. But we went into the Gulf of Tonkin. The, the Tonkin Gulf Yacht Club had gone by that point. But we went in and rattled our sabers and the North Vietnamese ignored us. So we came back in 75 um, to pick up the pieces. On the way here, I stopped at the American History Museum and reviewed uh, a lot of the clips they had from um, the Vietnam era. A lot of it brought back memories. Um, we operated in the Western Pacific. It was called the o Overseas Family Residence Program. And that was true. Our families did reside overseas, but we were at sea as much as any other carrier, uh, even though our home port was Yokosuka, Japan. So uh, during that time, uh, got to go to the Indian Ocean, hit all the uh, garden spots in uh, the Western Pacific, uh, Singapore and Hong Kong. And um, we even got to go to Pakistan at one point. But uh, in 1975 is um, when we uh, came back to Vietnam. Um, and what initially happened was the situation was getting critical and we left Japan and we headed south. We stopped by Okinawa to pick up some marine helicopters and we took them down to the Philippines area. Uh, and we transferred the marine helicopters uh, to the aircraft carrier Hancock, which was an old Essex class carrier. And they were acting as a helicopter carrier. So they were involved in what's called Operation Eagle Pull, which is the evacuation of Nam Pen. Um, we, um, at one point, since they were going to be acting as a helicopter carrier, we acted as their, um, their flight deck for their regular air wing. And it occurred, this cross-deck operation occurred in the San Bernardino Straits, which if you're a student of World War II history, that's one of the uh, four battles that occurred during the uh, Battle of the Leyte Gulf. And so it was kind of interesting to be up on the flight deck and see these historic straits uh, on either side of the carrier while you're conducting flight operations. Um, another interesting thing was that the Hancock, being an older carrier, operated A-4s, which is uh, called scooters, the little delta wing single engine jets. They're rather small, and they're so small that they don't even have folding wings. And when they're taxiing on the flight deck, they have these long, spindly landing gear. And in order to keep them from tipping over, the uh, flight deck crew has to hang from their armpits off the wingtips to keep the, uh, the Skyhawks from tipping over. So that was an interesting experience. Uh, we were gone about... Uh, 60 some days at sea with a, a brief import periods of one or two days. Um, and then we were alerted for uh, standing by off the coast of Vietnam. What we wound up doing was playing helicopter carrier. There were three amphibious ready groups. Uh, the Okinawa was one. The Hancock was acting as a helicopter carrier, and we were acting as a helicopter carrier. Now, the other two had marine helicopter uh, units, but we got a uh, Air Force uh, helicopter unit, the 56th Special Operations Wing, and there were 10 uh, CH-53 Jolly Green Giant helicopters. But being Air Force helicopters, they didn't have re uh, retractable rotor blades. So we had to spot these helicopters around the deck um, and there was really no room uh, for the rest of our aircraft. We had flown some of them off to the uh, Philippines and we stowed the rest on the hangar deck. So we were a big helicopter carrier. Uh, and it was interesting for me because uh, aboard the carrier, we had two O6 level rank. We had the captain of the ship, uh, Captain Larry Chambers, who became the first uh, black naval aviator to command a carrier, also became the first uh, um, to reach flag rank. And uh, a very interesting gentleman. He had just taken over 
command of the ship um, about a month or so before, the Air Force for 10 helicopters had three colonels, 06 level. A colonel working for a colonel working for a colonel. And uh, we gave the Air Force a lot of uh, guff about that because the only other 06 aboard the ship was the chief of staff for the embarked flag uh, the carrier group commander. So um, we waited off the coast. Uh, we prepared uh, and we watched the uh, North Vietnamese moving inexorably towards Saigon. Um, my job, I was assigned to be the ground order battle analyst. And so as the units uh, were reported in intelligence reporting, I made little white labels, little sticky labels, and we put them on a map that was overlaid with plastic. And so we could move the markers as the Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese forces retreated. And it got to the point where they were all converging around Saigon. And um, we dispensed with the map altogether and went with a photo mosaic of the Saigon area, including the what's called the Rung Sat, out to Vung Tau, which is a peninsula um, on the coast. And uh, as we were getting ready for the uh, operation, I had collected all these little labels into a styrofoam coffee cup. And when the operation finally launched, uh, I remember taking that coffee cup and dumping it into a wastebasket. And that was in uh, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam just being thrown away. Andrew, so. let's stop right there for a short break. We'll pick up with this dramatic story in just a moment. We're back. This is Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by U.S. Navy veteran and Vietnam War veteran Andrew Fulton. And Andrew, you were just telling us about the dramatic moment as it became clear that the South Vietnamese Army was about to be imploding as it was going yeah. around towards Saigon, that you had all these names in a coffee right. cup and right. eventually. Right, all the units, and I dumped them into a wastebasket. A lot of people have talked about Ambassador Martin and his uh, unwillingness to pull the plug. And uh, the, one of the landing zones was a parking lot in the embassy uh, because the roof of the embassy had a heliport, but it was only big enough for a small helicopter. So they wanted to cut down this tree, this tamarack tree that was in the middle of the parking lot. And the story that we heard was that the ambassador would not allow it but on the opposite side of the tree, away from the ambassador's window, they were slowly hacking away at the tree when he wasn't looking. So that when he finally did give the order, the tree came down. Now, the way the evacuation worked, um, like I said, there's three amphibious ready groups and there's a lot of other shipping. There's about 40 to 50 uh, ships involved in the evacuation operations. The CH-53s are the big cargo helicopters. Uh, they were designed to carry like 55 troops, but they were carrying like up to maybe 80 refugees. They would land, load them with as many people, and if they could get into hover, they would come back down and put some more on. Those are going from the embassy out to the amphibious ships. And then the smaller helicopters, the CH-46s, which is kind of a medium transport helicopter used by the Navy and Marines, those would take the people as soon as we process them from our ships to other ships. And then within Saigon itself and the area around it, the Air America helos, which are the silver and blue or silver and black um, ones run by the CIA, they would pick up people all over, and there's a famous photo of that silver helicopter picking up somebody off of a rooftop. But they would collect to the embassy compound and then come out to the ship. And we had the Master at Arms Force and the Marine Detachment. They would get a rope. They would have somebody at the head of the, uh, the rope, and everybody was told to hold on to the rope. And as they led them off the helicopters, they would take them to the other side of the island, the, the uh, starboard side, where there was a, a sheltered area where they could process uh, 
the refugees. We had um, foreign nationals, uh, news people, Vietnamese. Um, Was there any prioritizing of who got on the choppers first? Um, the uh, the story that I had picked up at the uh, museum was that uh, um, Ambassador Martin did not, he just loaded it up with, they tried to get as many people who cooperated with the Americans as possible out. And so he did not want to come right away, so they had to go back and get him. Um, and the last people out were uh, part of the Marine Detachment, which was securing the, the embassy uh, landing pad. Um, but there was a, a whole gamut of people, um, and the other part of the evacuation um, was the Vietnamese themselves. They had a, a lot of American helos, and they came out to the ship, and so they were crammed with all their families and everything. So. Um, this was really sort of after the main evacuation was, was supposedly over uh, because there are a lot of areas in the south that were, had not fallen yet. So they came out to the ships hoping that they would find uh, a place to land. And I remember being up on the flight deck and, and looking around and they were just circling the ship like, you know, around a wagon train, Indians around a wagon train. And they would fly up the side of the ship and throw out their weapons to show that there was no... Um, hostile intent, um, they would come in so fast that uh, we'd try to wave them off, but they would just go around and, and land on, on the angle. And most of them were Hueys, which don't have any wheels. They have landing skids. So in order to get them out of the way, they were coming so fast and furious that uh, you just had to push them over the side in order to rescue other people. So they lost a lot of aircraft, but uh, they saved a lot of people. Uh, we, on the Midway, did about 3,000 people. Um, the other uh, thing that was kind of historic from Midway was Major Bung Lee. Uh, he flew out from Kansan Island, which is off the coast of Vietnam. He was in a Cessna bird dog, which is normally a two-place airplane and it is wife and five children aboard. And they, were, they tried to communicate with him uh, by radio, and finally he succeeded in dropping a note, and he said he's got his wife and five kids. And they, there's no way he could ditch, and all of them would get out alive. So um, we pulled everything forward uh, and steamed into the wind, and uh, he landed on the flight deck, and... Uh, we all went nuts, so that uh, he got called up to the bridge and talked to the captain, and that Cessna bird dog is now in the Naval Aviation Museum. And one of these days, uh, I'm going to go down there and, and take a look at it. I, I actually uh, wasn't supposed to be on the flight deck. They, were, they wanted to have someone from the air intelligence section go up and notify the master at arms to send the pilots down to be debriefed, mm. so I volunteered. And uh, I went up there, and it was all chaos. And I had my clipboard, it's a badge of office. You, you know when you're doing something <laughs> official, you got a clipboard. And um, so the helicopters are landing all over the place. And I dropped the clipboard, helped push a Huey off the fantail. And then all of a sudden, the helicopters are about to land on me. So I figured I'd better get out of there. And I grabbed the clipboard and started booking across the flight deck heading for the catwalk. And uh, the air wing intelligence officer, Andy McPherson, said, where's Faltum? And then he looks up on the pilot landing aid television, sees me booking across the, the flight deck, and he was not happy. <laughs> uh, but I'd seen you know, all this on, on television, and uh, I didn't want to watch it on television. It was history. I wanted to, to see it and smell it. And, um, but uh, our skipper... Um, was up on the flight deck too and, and we just sort of looked at each other at one point and realized that these people had lost their country. And there was, there was uh, Vietnamese nuns and um, families. At one point uh, 
we had a bunch of refugees on the flight deck or on the hangar deck because we we didn't have uh, enough time to get them all off the ship. So uh, they were sleeping on bubble wrap or, or pads or whatever they could, and there were a bunch of kids. And one of the sailors asked me to draw some cartoons, so the kids could color with markers and things. And so uh, I drew up, you know, like Porky Pig and a couple other cartoon characters. And they mimeoed it off, and, and I said, oh, but you got to bring me one back. So I've got this um, drawing with kids coloring uh, from the Vietnamese refugees. After that, we, uh, it was officially called off. We had a whole bunch of helicopters. We went around to uh, Sada Heap, which is in Thailand, and we loaded all the aircraft, that fixed-wing aircraft that had flown out uh, the F-5s and the A-37s, the Tweety Birds that had flown out of uh, Vietnam into Thailand. And so we loaded those off. Then we wound up going to Guam to deliver the aircraft uh, to Guam. We, we salvaged about 101 aircraft. And uh, of those, the, there was the one bird dog, and the rest were either helos or, or fixed-wing uh, jets. So it was... Uh, rather ex interesting time. In That's terms of the end of the war, obviously, you had entered into the theater after the peace accords had started. So Right. So technically, I'm not a Vietnam veteran because I don't have that, um, that campaign. It's, uh, what they did give us is uh, they created the Humanitarian Service Medal, and we were also awarded the uh, Armed Forces Expeditionary Medal, which I guess allows me to join the VFW, and um, they gave us a Navy unit commendation for our role. That would probably be the uh, my brush with history, uh, and every time I see um, some of the pictures, you know, I sort of you sort of look for your face in the crowd. It causes you to stop and think that so much of history we don't necessarily participate in and when you do find yourself in a situation like that that you realize that it's history you want to remember everything even though you don't necessarily uh, remember everything. We're doing this interview in July of 2015 we're just a couple months past the 40th anniversary mm -hmm. of the fall of Saigon. Are those memories just as fresh for you today? Well um, when I knew I was going to do this uh, interview, I uh, went back and uh, refreshed my memory about uh, some of the events. And I went through, um, in the Navy, you don't have yearbooks, like high school yearbooks. You have what's called cruise books. And I went back through the cruise books, and I saw a much younger version of myself with a rather cheesy-looking mustache, because it was the 70s, and everybody... Uh, sure was uh, trying to get their hair as long as they could get away with and had mustaches and sideburns, and that was fashionable back then. Uh, you left the service in 1976, but one of the things that is often remarked about now with returning veterans is how much the country honors them and cheers for them when they come home. That was not the case at the end of the Vietnam War. What did you experience? Well, for me... Um, since they were winding down, I tried to uh, get a regular commission. I had a reserve commission, and I just, you know, I wasn't one of the ones picked up for reserve, but I, uh, for a regular commission, but I stayed in the reserves, and um, I retired in 95 as a commander. But I could see the difference after 9-11, because a lot of young people, uh, joined because of 9-11 and I see a different I see a different reaction to military service than the Vietnam War. Uh, I was a Chicago police officer so you get a lot of in the 70s you got a lot of that um, antagonism uh, between uh, all kinds of it was racial it was ethnic it was anti-war and it was on both sides. 
Uh, I think one police officer I talked to one time said he described the you know the, these riots and things as the blue mob versus the other mob uh, because that was kind of conflict just erupted in society and there was all kinds of things going on. At the time of 9-11, I was an uh, intelligence special with the, with the Army. And um, I was working in an office when it happened and we went into the SCIF, the uh, Sensitive Compartment Information Facility, to process the intelligence reports and everything. And I just didn't go home for like 30 some hours. But that marked a change in attitude towards uh, service in the military. It's, it, it's going to be interesting to see how that evolves in the future. Uh, we'd, our national attention span is not always that great. And if we can't solve a problem in uh, six months by throwing a lot of money at it, uh, we tend not to stay in for the long haul. You mentioned your time in the reserves as well as the private sector. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of it dealing with intelligence work, which was right. obviously what you were doing when you were active duty as well. What was it about that work that interested you so much? Most of my uh, adult life has been some form of public service, uh, either as a police officer, uh, active duty Navy reservist, a civilian intelligence specialist uh, working for the Army, and even when I uh, retired uh, from civil service and became a defense contractor. I was working on the joint staff, uh, working critical infrastructure protection. So um, the idea of doing a job just for money just does, it's got to mean something. I've never been shot at. I've never had to shoot anybody. And so I've never been in combat. But um, at least I know what it's like to be in an operational environment. And I can appreciate those who have been in combat. And you certainly assisted those who are in combat based on your positions in, in both places. Um, you also held a pretty important logistical position with the Army in terms of being in charge of materiel. Talk about that. Gentleman. Well, um, it was scientific and technical intelligence in support of acquisition. Um, basically, uh, when the Soviet Union was uh, still a force in being, you had to have a better tank than their tank. Uh, and so you have to uh, know what's going on with, with their technology in order to field better equipment and equip the, you know, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines with the best that we can give them. And so it, uh, It involved a, a lot of, um, an anal mostly an analysis, um, and projecting what, what the threat would be. And then uh, the material developers could uh, come up with something that would top the opposition. As you look back at your career, uh, what are you most proud of? Well, there's a uh, couple aha moments. Uh, when I was doing the ground order battle during frequent wind, um, the amphibious ready groups would have to move in during the day so they would have a shorter flight and then they would move out at night um, and as a ground order battle analyst I figured out what was the largest artillery piece that the North Vietnamese had and what the range of that was and that determined how far off the coast we had to be uh, because there have been uh, conflicts where shore batteries have uh, exchanged gunfire with ships offshore. So that was my, you know, contribution to the security of the, of the task force. Um, and then some other uh, times during uh, my civilian career with, uh, that you said the right thing at the right time and got the material developer aware of a threat uh, that they had to do something about. And that's kind of an aha experience, but I don't want to <laughs> go into classified or whatever. Sure. In our last few minutes, we want to talk about, in addition to uh, what he did after leaving active duty, and 
We talked about his time in the reserves in the private sector. You've also become an author, specifically looking at different ships uh, in the United States Navy. How did you get into that type of work? Well, um, at the time I was uh, in the defense attache unit in the reserves, and uh, one of our production tasks uh, was to write cultural behavioral handbooks. And I wrote, was writing the cultural behavioral handbook for Norway. That was a country I was assigned to. And I sort of self-taught myself a passable Norwegian. Um, but me, my uh, production officer was uh, Commander Jan Snukrogronje, and we and intelligence officers tend to be interested in history. And we started talking about ships, and, uh, and I was talking about the Essex-class aircraft carriers from World War II, and I said, it's, geez, I'm surprised that nobody's ever really written a book about them. And he said, write me a proposal. It turns out that he was a publisher, nautical and aviation publishing. Um, and they were originally in Baltimore, and now he's moved down to uh, South Carolina. And so uh, my first book was on the 24 ships of the Essex class. Um, it came out in 1996. It went to three printings. Um, I not only did the, uh, the writing, but a lot of the illustrations uh, for the book. And um, then the next book was going to be, uh, okay, well now they got that one, how about the Independence class light carriers from World War II? which are largely overlooked. So uh, the second book came out in 2002 from Nautical and Aviation on the Independence Light Aircraft Carriers. And then, since I had this carrier thing going, um, I proposed a book on the Forrestal and Kitty Hawk classes. And um, that was originally going to be by Nautical and Aviation, but the Naval Institute Press decided to pick it up. So that came out in uh, 2014. And um, I guess I've got a thing for aircraft carriers. But in the, in the books, I try not, not to make it too technical. Uh, I try to uh, aim it for a general audience and explain what it's like to be on a carrier. Uh, because unless you've been on a, a carrier, you really don't have a sense for what it feels like. Because... Uh, the flight deck of a carrier has been called the most dangerous four and a half acres on earth. And it's, it's no uh, exaggeration. Air Force pilots can come aboard a carrier and they can say, well, I'm, I'm pretty good. I could land on a carrier. I could take off from a carrier. But what really scares the bejeebers out of them is when they see these 18-year-old kids taxing aircraft within six inches of each other while there's helicopter rotors going and propellers spinning and jet blast uh, and intakes that could suck you up into a jet engine and it's just it looks like chaos but it's uh, it's carefully choreographed and the other things that you don't get uh, from seeing a movie or a documentary is that it's the smells and the sound the sound of uh, when a carrier turns into the wind and the fighters on the catapults uh, kick in their afterburners, the sound vibrates your rib cage like a drum. And the catapults are steam catapults, and they have this kind of a waxy smell. And uh, then there's also, if on a conventional carrier, you've got stack gases. So we used to come home from sea and your, and your wife would say, you smell like ship, because it permeates your, your, uh, your whole being and your clothes reek of the you know, fossil fuels uh, that uh, are on a ship. And um, that's the kind of thing I try to convey uh, to the readers, uh, describe how the planes operate from a carrier. and give their operational history, and then I have appendices for the, the technical things for those that are interested in the, in the technical aspects. Just about a minute left in our conversation. Any projects on the horizon? Uh, yes, I've, uh, I'm going to try to branch out and do a book on destroyers. And 
uh, the Fletcher class from World War II. Largest class of destroyers ever ever built, 175 of them. Um, and um, my pub nautical and aviation is still interested in doing some uh, Revolutionary War hero uh, biographies. So we're still looking into that. Are you still are you going to look more towards the naval side or um, more? General? I uh, it's more Revolutionary War from the, the Continental Army side. Uh, and some of the, the lesser commanders that haven't been written a lot about. Um, and we're still considering which ones are, are viable candidates for that. Um, if I went into more naval things, I would probably get into some of the biographies of the personalities from the C Civil War from the naval side. Um, anything else you'd like to add? Um, yeah, my my wife, uh, I always kid her that she's a historical naval person. But like I said, I met her at uh, the Armed Forces Air Intelligence Training Center at Lowry Air Force Base. And there had only been one other female to go through the course uh, before our class. And we had two women in our class. So um, she doesn't like to think of herself as a um, pioneer or... Uh, setting precedents, but uh, she did. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of her for that. For uh, What's her name? Cheryl. And her name is spelled S-H-E-R-R-Y-L, and I have yet to come across another <laughs> Cheryl that spells her name that way. Her mother supposedly named her after an actress that she saw in the credits of Stage Door Canteen. Uh, movie from World War II, but I think I've seen the, the credits and I, I didn't see a Cheryl in there <laughs> anywhere, so I don't know what the... Where all that came from. Well, uh, Mr. Faltham, it's an honor to have you with us. Thank you so much for your service to our country, and thank you very much for sitting down with us today. Uh, my pleasure. Andrew Faltham, again, veteran of the Vietnam War, as well as the U.S. Navy, and he's still more than 40 years after first getting on a naval ship, still writing about them in a series of books that we've just talked about. I'm Greg Corumbus. This has been Veterans Chronicles. Hi, this is Greg Corumbus, and thanks for listening to Veterans Chronicles, a presentation of the American Veterans Center. For more information, please visit AmericanVeteransCenter.org. You can also follow the American Veterans Center on Facebook and on Twitter, we're at AVC Update. Subscribe to the American Veterans Center YouTube channel for full oral histories and special features. And of course, please subscribe to the Veterans Chronicles podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and please join us next time for Veterans Chronicles.